Good morning and welcome to this webinar. We appreciate you taking the time out of your day to join us. Before we get started, I just wanna cover a few housekeeping items. This webinar is produced by the Underserved Victims Population Training Project, a project of the Center for the Innovation, for Center, for the Center for Innovation and Resources. Funding for this project comes from the California Governor's Office of Emergency Services, Victim Services Branch with funding made possible to the United States Department of Justice Victims of Crime Act. For those of you who can hear me, this might seem obvious, but I just want to remind everyone to turn on their speakers in order to hear the presentation. Use the Q&A feature to ask the presenter any questions that you may have. We will have time at the end of the webinar to answer your questions. You may ask questions anonymously by checking the anonymous box on the Q&A uh, chat feature. The chat box. The chat panel is where you can ask tech support questions. We will answer your questions immediately in the chat panel. An evaluation will automatically populate during the session. Please take a few minutes after the session to, uh, to fill out the evaluation. We value the feedback we receive from all of our training events. Now I'd like to welcome our presenter, Katie Kaywood. Uh, Katie Kaywood has worked in special education for over 40 years, first in the classroom as a teacher, an administrator, a researcher, and then as a professor at, the Na at National University. Her primary interest is working with difficult students that need structure to help them be successful. Her primary area of research included working across different cultural backgrounds and then issues surrounding autism. Upon retiring from the university setting, her interests have been dedicated to working with children and organizations that can benefit from her expertise. Currently, she is on the board for Autism Movement Therapy, the Partnership for Safe Families in Ventura County, and Step Up Ventura. Her work in education and communication helps to bring her expertise to each of these organizations. Uh, so now if you would all just bear with me a few seconds while I transfer the controls over to Katie. Hi, Katie. You go ahead and screen share. There we go. <laughs> Hi, everybody. I, first of all, I'd like to be able to thank you for your interest in autism and autism movement therapy. I'm totally blown away. I was telling Crystal this earlier. The, the number of people who are interested and who have signed up for this uh, just makes me feel very proud and, and very humble. So thank you. And I hope I live up to your expectations. First of all, I'd like to begin with an overview of what autism movement therapy is. It's a method that works with individuals across the spectrum to help them understand directions to music with movement. The structure and repetition helps to wake up the brain and provide meaning. This method has also been developed into a subsequent group entitled Autism Works Now, where individuals who have been successful are now working on pre-employment skills and working with the support needed to be successful in getting and keeping jobs. Each of these practices will be discussed and reviewed in this PowerPoint presentation. I also want to share with you what my proposed goals are for this presentation so that you can get at least an orientation of where we're going and what we're doing. First of all, I'm going to give you a brief background of characteristics of individuals with autism. I recognize that many of you are aware, but I wanted to be able to make sure that everybody it's a sense of what I'm referring to and what I'm talking about. And of course, how issues with autism relate to brain functioning, because autism movement therapy really does help to connect people and their brains so that they can actually begin to understand, listen, and communicate. But we'll get into that more later. I also want to be able to share a brief overview of methods used in teaching working with autism movement therapy and waking up the brain. Thirdly, I want to be able to do autism movement therapy in relationship to how it can be used with victims of crime who have autism. So the last thing I want to be able to do also is look at so social emotional behavioral reactions of those individuals and best practices when working with them. And of course, finally, we'll do questions. So with that introduction, Let's go forward. Okay. First of all, I want you to be able to orient yourself in terms of how I see autism 
and recognize that the concept of autism is absolutely huge. It does go across a spectrum. We have very low level functioning people. We have very high level functioning people. We have not necessarily included Asperger's recently in the concept of autism. They took it out of the DSM-5, I think it is. And that's unfortunate because we need to be able to see where autism is, where it's going, and what it can be. So we try to be able to deal with the whole entire spectrum. We, we look at it, but we, so we deal with those that are low level functioning through those that are higher level functioning. Autism can be defined according to appearance. Um, usually individuals with autism are gorgeous. <laughs> it's, it's, it's just totally blew me away. I think that's what attracted me to the field back in 1970 is the fact that these kids are, are striking. Um, but they have virtually no communication. And of course their behavior pretty much defines who they are and what's going on. In relationship to communication, they also have limited social skills. So what we are trying to do in so many instances is to be able to get them to be able to improve their communication and their social skills, and that helps to be able to deal with the behavior. Of course, their appearance is what we also recognize and go from there, because much of their behavior is communication. And in so many instances, I talk to people and say, yes, I know they have some really bizarre behaviors, but they're telling you something. Look at what they're telling you. Look at what they're upset about and recognize their behavior is a reaction to what's going on in the environment. Okay, <laughs> I will promise to try to be able to keep on, on key, but I chose this picture because I think this, this kiddo is, is cute and, and the fact is he's wearing a, a great t-shirt a lot of what we do in autism movement therapy is connected to Temple Grandin because she has supported us. She has supported our research. She comes in, she talks to us, um, and, and she's, she's an amazing individual. Uh, I'm sure that many of you who are familiar with autism are <clears throat> very aware of, of Temple and, and, and what she is and where she's gone. If you have any questions about that, I can certainly talk about that later. But accordingly... Uh, th this picture was taken, the person's hand who's reaching out to this kiddo is, is Joanne. Joanne Lara is the person who has developed autism movement therapy. She is a very good friend, and of course I've, I've coaxed her through a lot of her development. I, I'm not going to take credit for all of it, I promise, <laughs> because she, she has done an amazing job. Um, but again, she's looking at the concept of that autism is a brain issue and recognizing that, that the brain is, is just not connecting. We have some, some neurons that are misfiring and, and, and what her attempt is, especially her background in, in theater, her background in a variety of different areas, she, she's also using music to be able to help these kids learn how to connect those pathways in their brains. So, um, I, I am going to try very hard not to read the slides, but I want to be able to give you a chance to be able to read them. Um, I'm thinking that I, I, I think it's, it's very rude for people to read slides. So I know that I've given you a lot of words, but, but I will talk in the process of, of helping you do that too. Again, I, I've given you resources, or at least I gave Crystal resources that I, I hope she sent out. At any rate, the, one of the links that I gave you is this one for on Fox News. Uh, it shows the issue of, of autism and, and how the, the brain is, is very interconnected to why they're doing what they're doing Things are misfiring, and so it is important for us to be able to get them in line and get them focused. It's also important to be able to recognize that ah, autism has increased. It's, that's a tough one. It's, it's huge. It's very costly, and we have to be able to begin to work with it 
because until we can start to be able to help them function, it's going to cost us an awful lot of money. I think when I look through all of these bullet points from CDC, I recognize that yes, we've got money, it's the fastest growing development in the US, and bingo, there is no cure. What we can do though, is we can work with them and we can help them to be successful. The, the thing that I want people to recognize on so many instances is that everybody has something to offer, period. I don't care who you think you are, everybody has something to offer. And that includes all of our kiddos that are identified with special needs. It certainly includes all of our individuals identified with autism. So that we have to be able to figure out ways of working with them. And I'm hoping that this PowerPoint will help you get to that other side. Also, this, this helps you a little bit more. It's, it's not according to a specific race, socioeconomic status or, or educational levels of parents. It, it just, it's overwhelming. It's been a 273% increase in autism. People always ask me why, why do I think this is going on? Of course, that's a huge discussion. I can tell you that yes, we've started to become aware of it, but the reality is the individuals have increased in number. It is important to be able to understand that it's not just that we are finally recognizing who they are. These, this population is growing. And much of it has to do with our environment. Much of it has to do with what we're doing and, and what's going on. I can, I can answer those questions later if you're interested. Also, I think in my references, I gave you my, my connections and, and, and my contact number. So feel free to use it. I, so those are all discussions that is going to go beyond the hour that I have the presentation for. At any rate. Let's get back to common characteristics. We've got echolalia, um, these, these kiddos. Uh, and of course, this was a picture that, that was taken with the group that, that Joanne works with. Uh, because there's a variety of different kinds of art therapy things that she does, interesting kinds of situations. At any rate, those characteristics I chose to be able to make sure that you're recognizing who we're talking about what we're working with and, and how to be able to make sure that we're going forward. I also listed food allergies at the very bottom. <sighs> These kiddos, individuals, have a lot of allergies. And I first became involved with this population way back in 1974 when I was working with Dr. Bernie Rimland. And this is where we recognize that some of the food dyes were in fact interacting with these individuals, it, the food does in fact relate to how they function, where they're going, and of course they're very susceptible to things going wrong in their body. Their, their body is not processing normal. Um, so we, we of course want to be able to get the brain in line with, with everything else, as well as making sure we're paying attention to their allergies, because if we're not paying attention to their allergies, then we're disrupting everything. Okay, this is who Joanne is. She's an amazing individual. Uh, I've been working with her now for about 10 years. Uh, she has certainly developed autism movement therapy. Her, um, her master's degree from, from Cal State Northridge dealt pretty much with the brain and the brain functioning and food allergies and, and autism. And so her, her background is very solid. That is what her, her master's thesis was about uh, and she's she's a very outgoing amazing individual she's specifically looking at how to be able to connect the brain and to be able to define exactly what we need to do to be able to make it work you can see the picture in in the upper left corner it's looking at people movement through what's going on she's she's doing directions she's doing music in the background if you click on the website, and, and I've given you 
the, the website in terms of the references, and that's going to be Autism Movement Therapy, as you see in the bottom here. Um, you will see other videos that go along with who she is and what she does and, and how we do things. Um, the amazing thing about Joanne is that she has done outreach around the world, and <laughs> she's a, a, an amazing, outgoing individual. She's also looking at brain functioning and recognizing that there are particular areas that we need to be able to recognize are affected by autism. And we've defined three different areas that, that pretty much do relate to where these kids are and what's going on in their brain. Uh, I, I could get a little bit more specific uh, but again, we have to be able to look at the whole brain functioning. Um, let's just sort of pay attention to some of this first. I think that if you if you start to relate to some of these areas, you recognize certainly the auditory piece has to do with. The, the echoing that's going on in their heads and very often the repetition helps to be able to normalize their brain processing. So it is important to, to believe or recognize, I, too many recognizes, sorry, <laughs> but to that part, many of what they do helps to stabilize themselves. So the, 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 the rocking, the repetition, a lot of that helps to be able to normalize their brain as far as their heads are concerned. Um, what we want to be able to do is to be able to get it more towards, and, and be careful because there is no such thing as normal. There is neurotypical, and so in autism, we try to be able to look at those that are neurotypical, those that are not neurotypical. And of course, we want to be able to get them to the point of having their brains function as best as possible. Okay, I threw this slide in because I felt, of course, I was taking some of Joanne's PowerPoints as, as well as my own. These are the kinds of strategies that we have to be able to make sure that we are working with. And as far as I'm concerned, the most important one is the top one, building trust. We have to be able to have systems in place. We have to be able to have structure. We have to be able to make sure that we are doing things consistently. One of the things that drives individuals with autism to the curb, literally, is, is when people decide to come in and do something creative. <laughs> they need sameness, they need systems, they need to be able to have a level of trust that this is what I'm walking into, this is where I'm going, this is what I'm going to be doing, because their brains are not allowing them to naturally have trust, we have to make sure that we are providing for that environment that gives them the trust. Of course, that helps with the task and analyzation. Rituals are a form of systems. And of course, that has taught me particularly, I didn't believe in rituals before I started working with autism. And, and, and of course, I... I think I kicked and screamed to say, I don't want rituals. That's just not creative. <laughs> rituals help us get through life. It is so important to be able to recognize that the ritual of waking up in the morning, brushing your teeth, etc., it gets us to the next step. Rituals have taught me in working with autism that, yes, rituals are important. They're not only important for the kiddos that I work with, they're important for people. So we need to be careful that we are not knocking rituals. Positives, of course. Um, they utilize self-speech. It's important for us to recognize that self-speech is also important. It helps us to be able to get from one point to the next. Also, using music. It is amazing what we can do with music. And of course, I'll give you some of the, the issues that go on with the music and, and how we use it in autism movement therapy. Again, this gives you a brief overview of what autism movement therapy is. I think 
If you recognize the characteristics that I talked about in the previous slide, you'll recognize here combining patterning, visual calculation, of course, rhythm sequencing, and whole brain. Music does that, and music helps to bring it together. We just have to be able to use that music to be able to get them to be able to have their brain connect the neurons, etc., everything. So the piece here, the remapping piece, is key. She also talks about left brain and right brain. And for those of you that are familiar with the concept of left and right brain, there are different parts that go along with each area. And I'll let you review these very quickly. The point here is to be able to make sure that the right and the left brain are communicating because there are characteristics that are important to be able to have these kiddos be able to help their brain put itself together. Very often they might only respond using part of their brain. We have to be able to make sure that they're doing both. And this gives you certainly a synopsis of what I just said. We have to be able to make sure that there is a bridge between the two brains, the two parts of the brain. I love that, two brains. <laughs> but autism movement therapy in helping the connective tissue to be able to communicate one side to the other, it wakes up the brain. And it's kind of magical to see that development happening. It doesn't happen overnight, but we'll get into some of that too. After reading this, I want you to be able to remember they've got the receptive audio processing, the rhythm, the tempo, the sequencing, and the whole brain approach. The rhythm, the tempo, the music helps them, of course, through repetition to be able to help the connections in their brains. It's amazing. We have seen kids who basically don't speak, speak, and then they even get to the point of being able to read. It's when we are getting their brains to be able to help to start to function, they can actually get from one point to the next point. It's kind of cool. And here we have Temple Grandin, of course. Temple has been a, a wonderful supporter. She, she's certainly been part of fundraising. She's certainly helped uh, write um, sequences for, for Joanne's books and everything else. She's an interesting individual. People always ask, well, aren't you going to go here with Temple? It's like, well, I've heard Temple quite a few times. Um, she is an amazing person. I'm not going to downgrade that. She always has the same message. She always says the same thing. Um, she obviously has autism. There is no question about the fact. But she is an amazing individual in terms of what she has been able to do with her PhD, with, with how she, she's been able to, to work with animals. Um, it's, that's a whole nother conversation. <laughs> okay. And here, I want you to be able to see the fact that we use a lot of patterning, movement, certainly stop, forward, stop, forward, and, and repetition. Of course, Joanne, you'll see her in, I think, the, the black with the blonde hair um, in the bottom left. You'll see her in a variety of different pictures. She certainly works with, with these kiddos. She, she started this about 10, maybe 12 years ago now, and we've been on her board ever since. 
Uh, she, she wanted to be able to work with kids in terms of movement. Of course, she's a classroom teacher. Of course, she's, she's a variety of different things. But she, she also said that she really wanted to be able to work with them to be able to help them get to the next step. So this shows you a picture of, of how they work with things. The, the important thing also here is that the huge mirror that she's got in front of her studio to be able to help individuals see, listen, this is, this is what I'm doing, this is how I'm looking, this is what I'm supposed to be doing. Again, more pictures. But perfect because here she is also teaching adults to be able to work with kids. So a lot of what her training is, is training adults to be able to work with autism movement therapy. She does trainings around the world. For example, I think she's doing something in New York City coming up, and then she's doing something in India. She's also done something in China. Um, she's, she's amazing. And then the important thing about music is, I, I think this is the, the key piece here, is we look at the fact that music and dance help us to be able to calm and organize our brains. Um, many of us who recognize that as we're in the car or as we're working or something like that, if we've got music in the background, it does help us to sort of calm down, but it also helps us to relax and helps us to be able to use our body, our ears and our eyes. I like this piece here about the whole brain. It, music does help to organize things. It's, it's interesting because there have been so many different kinds of stages that I personally have gone through. And somebody came into my life maybe about five years ago and said, hey, you work in a lot of quiet. Why don't you have background music? It'll help you calm down. It'll help you get through things. And of course, I did try it. And yes, now I do work with background music. Because music is, is integral to making us relax and get through things. Think about it. Of course, when we work, work with individuals that have autism and help their brains to communicate, it will help them to be able to relax, but also regulate their brain. <clears throat> Again, another slide that has a lot of words. Um, but I think that those words need to be said, and I wanted to be able to make sure that you got a sense of what she's saying. I think that, that in addition to, of course, the last statement, it's important to recognize that dancing helps us to communicate. I uh, guess there's all sorts of different kinds of dancing. We can, we can think of a variety of, of, of orientations for dancing, but recognize that in dancing we are releasing, we are also communicating. And it adds beauty to our lives. I think that's key as well. This is the structure that goes along with what she recommends for autism movement therapy, it needs to be scheduled, period. Many of us who have gotten into something like meditation, you need to schedule meditation as well. But of course, autism movement therapy, it needs to be X amount of time. Those people who work out, they always work out for X amount of time, but to be able to make sure that it is consecutive. She recommends at least two to three sessions a week. And of course, 12 weeks minimally um, to be able to get from one point to the other because you have to be able to do the repetition, the practice repetition across time will help to be able to create pathways. I think this part here in terms of overall self-determination, awareness and self-esteem, we have seen that. It is amazing to see how these kids all of a sudden are smiling and they're not having 
the behavioral outbreaks that we have seen in so many instances because all of a sudden their their brain is starting to be able to function appropriately little by little and and they are able to go forward and to be able to be communicative successful in a variety of different things I love this, substantial progress with the pragmatics of language and actual speech articulation. It's just, when that happens, it's just, it makes you smile and it makes you happy and want to run and play. <laughs> I love the Yiddish proverb that, that, that even a bear can learn to dance. <laughs> I'm not sure. I, granted, I've never seen a bear dance. I'm sure that, that uh, it might happen. But to that piece, this talks about, again, the use of the left and the right to be able to help sh make sure that you are looking at both through patterns as well as movement and listening to music. Of course, the right side, the right side very definitely looks at the creative artistic side but to be able to get the left side to be able to communicate with the right side, movement, music, and repetition will help these kiddos get from one point to the other. And yes, it's evidence-based. So that there are goals, and we have seen progress, and, and we have recognized that the brain does in fact seem to be able to communicate and improve. No, there, uh, as I'm keying in on this whole kind of thing, there haven't been autopsies. We haven't seen actually brain development, but we've, we've seen the effect in, in the behavior. We've seen the improvement in these kiddos. And one of the questions that was said that I, I want to answer very quickly is that we have done this more on an individual basis. It has been parents who have brought their kiddos to, to practitioners because of course Joanne has trained many, many people. I think she's, she's trained at least um, several hundreds of people who, who have learned how to be able to be therapists and working with autism movement therapy. So, so to that extent, that's how we have gone out and trained people. Um, it's not that she's only working with kids. She is working with adults and training adults. So um, we have seen these things happen across a variety of populations. And of course, the stories that have come back have been amazing. Again, This gives you a flavor of certainly what parents have said about where individuals have gotten to. We have also developed something called Autism Works Now because we have taken autism movement therapy and taken it up a level and we are now especially focusing on training individuals to work employment and, and to be able to get out there and hold jobs. Uh, and, and the last part of my PowerPoint presentation is going to talk about Autism Works Now. So the, the, the piece here that I absolutely love is the different countries that she has gone to and she has trained. Um, the fact that she's been to China, the fact that she's been to Bangladesh, Kuwait, and, and certainly so many different areas where she has trained adults to be able to work with kiddos in terms of autism movement therapy. There is a huge interest out there. Of course, there's a huge population that needs to be worked with. And she has seen a lot of success through the reports that have come back of adults writing her saying, oh my goodness, what, what you taught me, what, what I've been training, these individuals that I work with are now communicating and functioning. It's magical. It is also important to be able to recognize, though, that there are issues about cultures and relating to autism. And I threw this slide in because as far as I'm concerned, 
in, in certainly the classes that I've developed and, and the, the courses that I've taught, it is imperative for us to be able to recognize multicultural differences. You cannot necessarily expect the same thing from a white family you can have the same goals. I'm not going to go there. But the kinds of cultures have different expectations in terms of who they are and what they do. My dissertation, completed back in the 80s, of course, <laughs> looked at multicultural issues and how families function across their environments. Um, I certainly looked at Hispanic. I certainly looked at Chinese, and then I, of course, compared that to Anglo. So, so to that part, there are qualitative differences. It is important to be able to work with the individual from where they're orienting themselves. So that how one culture treats autism is not going to be the same as how another culture treats autism. How one culture treats education is not the same how another culture treats education. So keep that in mind recognize that there are certain standards that certain cultures relate to and certain standards that other cultures relate to. And this is also getting into therapy when working with, with individuals that have autism. So it is important to remember the cycle, the grief cycle, because every single parent who has an individual with autism, and of course they deal with it in so many different ways, and I'm sure that many of your backgrounds have recognized some of this, but there is a grief cycle that each and every one of them go through because it was expected that having this child, this absolutely gorgeous child, was going to be the answer to their prayers. When they recognize all of a sudden that there's something not exactly right about this kiddo as they're growing up from, usually it's, it's recognized at about a year and a half to two years old, sometimes later, it depends upon the situation, you have to go through a level of grief and you have to recognize that this is something that was not what you wanted. Certainly confusion, it starts with you have to get over it. So you have to go through that cycle. And I'm sure that as I looked at, at many of the people who are listening to me and, and what they're bringing to the table, you know what I'm talking about when it goes through those kinds of therapeutic issues. The important part, obviously, starting with confusion, anger, and sadness, is getting help and then comfort in numbers. So having people recognize and communicate with each other is, is huge. This Cecile Cura, is, she's an amazing individual. She, she was one of the first textbooks that I used to be able to, to work with teaching um, teachers how to be able to work with autism. It's a wonderful resource. At any rate, here we have some of the things that, that I believe and I have seen is most effective in terms of working with victims. And I am sure that many of you have heard or seen issues where individuals with autism have been abused. For whatever the situation may be, it can be anger, it can be a variety of different kinds of things, whatever has happened, we have to be able to get these individuals with autism to the other side. We have to be able to take them from where they have been to, to where they need to get to. And those kinds of characteristics that work the best or those kinds of strategies that work the best have to do with what makes them successful in the first place. You have to build that safety. We talked about safety in the first place. We had the, the issue of structure, and we had the, the, the concept that you have to be able to have repetition, you have to be able to have something expected, and that's safety, so that you, you have an environment that where the individual walks into the room or whatever the situation may be, it is going to be the same thing that they got the day before or the sequence of, of maybe repetition, music, whatever, it's going to be the sameness, and that sameness is the safety and the trust. Music will help, certainly. The music, the repetition helps to relax them, to be able to get them to be able to accept the environment. Um, again, the sameness, 
They like sameness. Don't take away their sameness because their sameness is trust. Uh, I love this predictable schedules. Don't change it up. Don't change it up because you're being creative or, oh, especially in the classroom, the thing that happens so often, oh, today we have a fire drill. <laughs> it's going to throw everything out the window. Uh, because they need to be able to know what's going on. You have to be able to prepare them. You have to be able to make sure that they know predictable. Okay, this time it's going to change. I need to tell you it's going to change, and this is why it's going to change. Make sure you're not necessarily using as much language as behavior. They're, they're going to be able to read the behavior a whole lot better than they're going to be able to read the language. The amazing thing to me Certainly when I first started working with individuals with autism way back, oops, excuse me, way back 1978, was that somebody told me, be careful because you have to be able to low key your energy because they're going to read off your energy, just like animals. They read off your energy. They can see energy almost better than we can see energy. So this is why I say even low key energy because you don't want them to feed off your energy and you don't want them to be able to push buttons. So if you can maintain your low key energy and work with them systematically, this is going to help them in terms of therapeutic orientation. Making sure that you're, the last piece I love that I've listed here is connecting and caring. They see that as well, they see behaviors, they understand behaviors. They communicate well with behaviors. Again, recognizing that their communication of their outrageous behaviors is for their benefit as well as for yours. Because sometimes the rocking, sometimes the biting, sometimes a variety of different kinds of things, it helps to be able to show you that they need help. They need to be able to have the system in their brain. Um, the rock, I, interesting, I, I saw something recently and and I, it didn't occur to me, but yes, the repetition in the rocking helps the brain normalize itself. It's like, wow, what an amazing concept. At any rate, again, predictable schedules, low-key energy, connecting, and caring. And, and I, I wanted to be able to make sure that you're looking at this in terms of victims, but you're also recognizing that these areas are imperative. Because if you don't have them, it's not going to work. Now we get to the point of, I want to be able to show you what we've been able to do with Autism Works Now. This piece shows that we have been able to take individuals 14 to 17 year old because we recognize that schools are not teaching people how to be successful in terms of the workplace. We have this concept of academics that it's going to be able to prepare people for college. Well, that's not necessarily the way that everybody needs to go. Of course, we, we want to be able to make sure everybody gets there if they can, but in so many of our kiddos, they can, and, and we, we certainly support that, but we want to be able to have them be successful in terms of working. And what we came up with was a system of teaching pre-employment skills and getting them to be able to work with those skills and be productive and successful. We, this is amazing because, well, and again, she, she recognizes that she wants our individuals with autism to be able to have a seat at the table. And if you look at her website, you'll see the seat at the table mentioned so many different ways because she wants to be able to make sure that they are part of who we are and where we're going and they're not necessarily left out at the fringes. i show you some pictures of what's going on. Um, certainly Tumble Grandin and Joanne together. Um, but we have a variety of, of celebrities and things like that. We've done some fundraisers. We've, we've done, we, we had um, Larry King uh, benefit with Larry King in the Beverly Hills um, with Ed Asner and a variety of other things. Um, it's, it's amazing that the people who have stepped up to be able to help support who we are and what we do. Um, 
this is, we had, actually we had a pie truck and, and lo and behold, we, we designed the whole thing. We had the pictures that you see, the glorious pies there because we wanted these individuals to be able to run a business and we wanted them to be able to sell pies. So we, we came up with this concept that we were going to have a pie truck. Unfortunately, we, we, we had it, we built it, we brought it out from Florida and it didn't pass the regulations for California, the health regulations. So we decided to do it another way and do it outside in terms of conferences and in a variety of different kinds of places. And so this is the example of where we are at this point in time. We, we do still want to be able to go with a pie truck idea. We're going to have to build something out here that is, is going to work with our regulations. Uh, but we want to be able to be able to take glorious pies and and do it around the country so that other other organizations can benefit from the concept and be able to take these adults you know basically all of these individuals are adults we want to be able to take them forward and help them be successful but this is one of the, the great pictures that go along with the glorious pies again we've got you know somebody younger here too but we want to be able to make sure that we are giving people the opportunity to be successful in selling things. And yes, we we have made money that has helped to be able to to get it from point A to point B and 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 be successful so that they're learning the skills of making change and, and, and going from um, things working. So um, it's, it's a great example of, of where we're going and what we're doing. And that pretty much brings me to the point of questions. Um, I think the time is pretty good. So uh, I'd like to be able to stop and, and ask if you've got questions that I can answer. Okay, so um, as a reminder, please enter your questions into the Q&A feature on your taskbar. But uh, Katie, I wanted to ask you the first question that was emailed in which was, um, are early intervention programs using movement therapy for children with autism? And, and I apologize for the background train noise. Um, <laughs> <laughs> timing. <laughs> what can I do? <laughs> Sorry. Um, at any rate, um, in California, the way that we have been able to, to work with this, we don't necessarily have these systems established. In elementary schools or even in LA Unified it's been very tough to be able to get through LA Unified we'd like to be able to work with individuals across the ages and across the spectrums the only way that we've been able to do that is to be able to train the adults who can put it in their own classrooms and do their own things um, again it's it's more of an individual kind of situation okay uh, there was a question that was just asked um, if a child has, I'm not sure what that is, um, maybe behavior of opening and shutting door, do you d redirect to a different pattern? Uh, yes, of course I would redirect to a different pattern, but I would also recognize what are they doing and why are they doing it. So, I'm, I'm okay, they're opening and closing doors. Are they wanting change? Are they wanting to be able to see who's coming in? They want to be able to have control over who's going in or why are they doing what they're doing? Their behavior is communicating something specifically. We need to be able to recognize what that communication is all about as we, uh, we need to be able to make sure that we are redirecting and helping them find another way or asking them to talk if you can get them to talk. They want to leave. Well, okay, they want to leave. And so what you need to do is to be able to make sure that you're giving them options to be able to stay and leave but also be productive. All right, thank you. We have another question that came in and it's, is there a cost for the training in Van Nuys? If so, is there a discount for MFT students? Um, again, you'll have to work with Joanne on that. She, she works out with, yes, it is a cost because of course it, it costs her to train and, and she has to be able to get um, her money to be able to support her organization and, and or our organization and to be able to go forward. But she will work with people and, and I again um, use the resources that I sent out to be able to talk with her.
Uh, there's another question that said, do you still recommend ABA services or how do you integrate these with your program? <clears throat> ABA is key because that helps to establish certainly the reinforcements. It helps to establish pinpointing behaviors and also helps to be able to get their brain organized in terms of positives. <clears throat> of course, I will not ever say negatives. I do not believe in using any kind of negative. I don't care, uh, you know, whether it's, it's the, the operational orientation of a negative. So, so removing something, whatever the situation may be, if I can orient it around positives, I will orient it around positives if I, I possibly can. Um, granted, I won't let them do some negative things, so I won't necessarily have those stimulus that create those negative behaviors if I can possibly do it. Again, ABA is important and ABA is successful. ABA will show you evidence related therapy. And, and so you have to be able to take things together and work with it. Okay, I, oh, here we go. What culturally can you do or say to get Mexican parents to accept? Okay. Uh, is that the disorder? Uh, I, okay, I, I get that. Um, the the thing that is important. Oh, sorry, I, sorry. I hear that. Um, got it. Diagnosis. Yes, okay. I'm learning this language. <laughs> That's okay. Um, <clears throat> I agree to accept the diagnosis. I, you know, working with them, it's a process. It's an absolute process. And and again, you have to be able to work with making sure that the parents are comfortable, that the parents are okay. It is it is very difficult to be able to work with some parents. Uh, you know, uh, yes, the, the Hispanic, pop, the, the Latina population is tough. I, I agree with that. Also, the, the, those Asians, Chinese, et cetera, um, they don't accept it either. To that extent, it, it is a black spot on their record and who they are. They, for, for many, many years, decades, they have housed them in closets. Um, the, the Latina population, you also have the issue that they are very family based and they want to be able to, to do this in terms of the orientation of their family. So, and of course their family is not necessarily going to accept it or recognize it. Uh, you have to be able to work within the system of the culture and, and, and go from there. I'm not, I, I don't find any future has an easy time. Some Mexican parents know it and are, are relieved when others resist, especially fathers. You know, fathers resist in any culture. I, I agree with you. It is difficult to work with fathers, but it's amazing to me, especially more recently than the newer um, population, newer um, orientation. I've seen more fathers work with, with kiddos with autism than I've seen mothers lately. Uh, the challenge that's out there, the, the fact that they want to be able to connect up with these kids and they, they find success. It's, it's amazing how things have sort of changed around across cultures. I mean, it, it depends again on individuals. You have to be able to work with who you are and where you're going. Uh, make sure that you see it as a challenge and, and get to know the people. Uh, it's, it's, yes, it can be incredibly frustrating in my many years of working with so many different kinds of, of kiddos and, and families, etc. Uh, it's amazing when all of a sudden things come together. Uh, and, and yes, there's a certain huge orientation of burnout. You have to be careful. Of course, teachers burn out, therapists burn out, etc. You vary who you are and who you work with, which keeps you from burning out. You can burn out very easily in working with this population because they're very intense. But again, I encourage you to be able to look at the positives and work with who you are and where you're going. I hope that helps. I hope I'm not dancing either. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's all the questions that we've we've gotten in. So I just wanted to thank you, Katie, for um, having this webinar. It was very informative and I wanted to thank you all for participating. Um, please look out for uh, the evaluation that's going to be automatically populated at the end of the webinar and then we will also be sending you a certificate of attendance through email along with the resources that Katie has sent to me. So I hope you all have a great day and thanks for joining us. Thank you.